hello. Oh, I nearly sat on my glasses then. Instead of sitting on my glasses, I'm sitting on my something rather similar. Hello there, how you doing? I'm looking in the wrong place again. I do apologise, I think. Over there. So, are you sitting comfortably? Good. Meet your hemorrhoids have cleared up. <laughs> okay, so I am Paul Murphy. Also, that Paul Murphy. And I haven't done this in a long, long time. So long, I haven't done this in all. So long. Um, I thought I'd do um, some readings from one of my books. And this is one of my books. And it is called Paul Murphy's Extremely Unlikely History of the World. Part 1. Or Volume 1. Part 1. Part 1 of 3. Um, so, let's get started in with it, shall we? And, uh, do you know what I thought today what amused me? You know, <laughs> you know you go to the supermarket sometimes, and, um, sorry, I was thinking about something else, then. Said, 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 said supermarket, it made me think of someone. Um, so, um, <laughs> Mrs. Elsie Sludge of 19 Gallbladder Street, Croydon. I miss her. And the gallbladder. So, um, you know how people sometimes leave shopping lists, you know, they do shopping, and you get take a trolley out, and a discarded shopping list is inside there, you know. And I thought, it would be funny to make, make one up and leave it into a trolley. And so you'd have, um, like, extra strong bin liners, masking tape, uh, five bottles of bleach, strong saw, the inference being, you know, all the accoutrements that one would need to dispose of a dead body, like, you know, I'm assuming, I know very little about these things. Uh, <coughs> but anyway, you know, so I thought that'd be funny, like, you know, so I'd pick that up and go, look. I didn't have a ruder version of that as well, but I'm not going to do it, you know. Anyway, so... I should put some glasses on and be like, oh, goodness me, I can see what I look like now, and that's not a pleasant sight. I've got the camera in the wrong place. Why is the camera in the wrong place? It's supposed to be looking at the pictures of my children on the wall behind me. Oh, uh, yeah. okay, well, I can't put it any further back. It'll be in the next postcode. Where should we start? Uh, Iceland. Do you want to hear about Iceland? Okay. <laughs> oh, actually, okay, the... What was this one here? That looks funny. I should go back and I should start with Hungary instead then. So, Hungary. You're expecting the next line to be, no, I've just had dinner. But you're wrong. I've just had brunch. <laughs> be yogurt in case you're curious. However, the H in the name of Hungary is most likely due to early ill-founded historical associations with the Huns, who had settled Hungary prior to the Avars. The rest of the word comes from the Latinized form of medieval Greek, Ungari. So there. <laughs> Early stuff. The Roman Empire conquered the territory west of the Danube between 35 and 9 BC. As there were only four shepherds and a saw sheep named Clara there at the time, it was a wonder they took so long. All I can tell you is that Clara was a lot sorer by the time they'd finished. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't think I've read this since I wrote it. From 9 BC to the end of the 4th century, Pannonia was part of the Roman Empire, located within part of later Hungary's territory. Here, a 600-strong Roman legion created the settlement Aquincum in AD 41-54 and invented the grilled sandwich. Bacon and lettuce, in case you're curious. Later came the Huns, <laughs> who built a powerful empire and a huge toilet, just to see what one would look like. <laughs> after <laughs> after Hunnish rule, the Germanic Ostrogoths, Lombards and Gepids, and the polyethnic Avars had a presence in the Carpathian Basin, whilst the Plugs had a presence in the Sink Basin. Or they later invented bric-a-brac, in case you're curios. <laughs> I'm amusing myself here, in case you're curios. Ah, even I thought that was clever, and I wrote this. <laughs> Glasses are steaming up now, I don't apologise. <laughs> 
the Magyars lived in Lvidia, in the vicinity of the Kazakh. Goodness me, these places got some weird dates. All these, uh, the facts in this book are um, true, you know, so I did the research and then I spoofed it. I should have just used, changed the words to something I could pronounce. Let's get back and do the bit again. As I said to the wife on our honeymoon. <laughs> the Magyars live. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the Magyars lived in Levedia, in the vicinity of the Khazar Khaganate in the early 9th century, and were organized into tribes, each headed by their own voivodes or military leaders, or mothers in law. After what? After a Pechenegg invasion against Lavedia, a group of Magyars crossed the Caucasus Mountains and settled in the land south of the mountains, taking Clara with them. But the majority of the people fled to the steppes north of the Black Sea. From their new homeland, which was known as Etelkols, the Magyars controlled the land between the Lower Danube and the Don River in the 870s, and more importantly, had spare batteries for the remote control. The confederation of their seven tribes was led by two supreme chiefs, the Kenda and the Gyoila. The Kabars, a group of rebellious subjects of the Khazars, joined the Magyars in Etelots. It's no fun being grabbed by the Gyulias and then taken up the Khazars, I can tell you. There's a little bit of Frankie Howard there, isn't it? Oh, no, oh, caught by the Khazars. Oh, no, stop it, stop it. To all my overseas viewers, that'll mean nothing at all to you. Where do we get to here? Um, the Magyars regularly invaded the neighboring Slavic tribes, eating all their custard, forcing them to pay a tribute, and seizing prisoners to be sold to the Byzantines. The Byzantines then sold them on again on eBay, listing them as like new somewhere, occasion of sword injury. <laughs> Taking advantage of the wars between Bulgaria, East Francia, and Moravia, the Byzantines invaded Central Europe at least four times between 861 and 894, getting as far as the front gate before realizing they hadn't packed enough warm clothing and going back home again. Eventually, they merged with the Forolds, <laughs> became the Forold Angusites. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> a new Pechenegg invasion compelled the Magyars to leave Etalox, cross the Carpathian Mountains and settle in the Carpathian Basin around 895. Why have I suddenly gone into a false accent? I don't know. In war-ridden times, the Pechenegg put the Carpathian plug in and turned the taps on. Oh. <laughs> Even I thought that one was corny. <laughs> Elsewhere... <laughs> Elsewhere, the sphincters were invaded by the hemorrhoids, and screams were heard as far away as Cleethorpes. Fun fact, the true ones are the best. One of the only coherent sentences ever attributed to the somewhat short of a sixpence Emperor Ferdinand I was, I am the Emperor and I want dumplings. That is a true story as well. So, Iceland. Iceland, in geological terms, Iceland is a young island. It started, I should start that again, I read the, um, I read the full stops wrong. Two, three, four. Iceland. In geological terms, Iceland is a young island. It started to form in the oh, Miocene, Miocene era about 20 million years ago from a series of volcanic eruptions on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And as such, it has kept its figure much better than many islands who have had two or three tectonic movements. <laughs> it also means it gets hit on by a lot of middle-aged male islands who tell it that their wives don't understand them by lots of expensive topography and they invite it up to their plateaus to see their tectonic shafts. <laughs> Etymology of Iceland. There are several opinions about the etymology, which is the study of etis. <gasps> Most believe the name arrives from a combination of ice, ice, and land, land. <laughs> Others say that the country was discovered... <laughs> I know what's coming up, I do apologise. Others say that the country <laughs> was discovered by Norse Viking Denal Ekil 
and he just used his name backwards. Although this would have been a waste of time since, by an amazing coincidence, Danal Eki in Ancient Norse Viking is pronounced Iceland. Ask any Ancient Norse Viking if you do not believe me. Recorded settlement of Iceland has conventionally been dated back to 874, long after the rest of Western Europe had been settled, unsettled, resettled, and anti-disestablished settled. Although archaeological evidence indicates, indicates Gaelic monks had settled Iceland before 874, most notably in a big sign that reads, We were here before 874. However, the mystery deepens when one factors in that 874 in ancient Gaelic monk is pronounced March the 8th, 1937. Ask any ancient Gaelic monk if you don't believe me. The first permanent settler in Iceland is usually considered to have been a Norwegian chieftain and grad stitcher <laughs> named Ingolfur Arnason and his wife, Halvig. F oh, God. Smith. Okay. <laughs> For the daughter, too, it looks like it says. According to the Land in the Book, the Icelandic Book of Settlements, remember what else is out there if you start to get bored with my book, sailing along, Arneson threw two carved pillars overboard as he neared terra firma, vowing to settle wherever they landed. He was rather disappointed to watch as they drifted back out to sea and came to rest in the cleft of a walrus's bum. Let's try best out of three, he said to Helvig, and threw them again. They drifted all the way back to Norway. Are you taking the piss, Thor? <laughs> he said. <laughs> he screamed at the heavens, and after sailing all the way home to get them back again, he threw them overboard once more. Ouch! cried Eagle Bluenson, who was swimming by at the time and caught them full on the back of his head. Oh, Odin, he'll sue us, wailed Helvig, but Ingnorf took her arm and gently convinced her that he wouldn't. It was an accident, he was a nice man, and he was dead. Helvig was calmed, although not as much as Eagle Blurison was, and gently <laughs> said to her husband, Look, just carry the fucking pillars to the beach. Ingolf did as he was bade and made a mental note to take Helvig swimming just as soon as any other available nook he turned up. Along with his stepbrother, is Eric Smith. <laughs> <laughs> he founded Reykjavik in 874 rather than get a paying job. <laughs> steam, from hot steam from hot springs in the region is said to have inspired Reykjavik's name, which loosely translates to Smoke Cove, although other sources, well me, posit that the name comes from the fact that Vic is the ancient Norwegian set the word for arse, and the original name was derived from Don't sit down there, those hot springs will wreck your Vic. Ask any ancient Norwegian settler, ask any ancient Norwegian settler if you don't believe me. The interior of Iceland consists of a plateau characterised by sand and lava fields, mountains and glaciers, and cheese and tomato sandwiches, whilst many glacial rivers flow to the sea through the lowlands, not that they ask for them. Iceland is warmed by the Gulf Stream and has a temperate climate, despite a high latitude just outside the Arctic Circle. Its high latitude and marine influence keep summers chilly, with most of the archipelago having a tundra climate, i.e. no colder than minus three degrees centigrade, although you still wouldn't want to piss against a metal pole unless you've got a fiberglass urethra. Because of its gene genealogy, <laughs> I don't think so, because of its geology and landmass, Iceland is the most sparsely populated country in Europe, with 98% of its population living in number 37, Laugva Street, Reykjavik. Fun fact. Until the 20th century, Iceland relied largely on subsistence fishing and agriculture and was amongst the poorest countries in Europe. No matter how many fish they planted or how many cows they grazed at sea, they just could not make a profit. So that was a couple of entries very badly read there. I'm so sorry, I'm stumbling on what I'm wearing that um, from my book, Paul Murphy's Experience. I remember that. that was only 14 minutes next year, so I don't know. And if you wanted proof, <laughs> Please yourselves. <laughs> Netherlands. Have I got time to do the Netherlands? I do like the Netherlands chapter, but okay. 
I'm going to try and do the Netherlands. Let me just try and get my jaw up into action here. Netherlands. The Netherlands is a country in... Stop falling down. It doesn't say that. I'm just talking about it. Netherlands. The Netherlands is a country in Western Europe. Or at least it was yesterday. It is also informally known as Holland. Although Holland is a region on the western coast of the Netherlands. If you wanted to, you could go to the county line, have one foot in the Netherlands, one foot in Holland, and say to people, look, I'm in two countries at the same time as being in one country. And they would fall to the ground with laughter, or kick you in the bollocks. Give it a go and find out for yourself. Shh. Talk it. Honestly. Netherlands literally means lower countries. <laughs> <laughs> but only in Dutch to English. <laughs> Netherlands literally means Nederlanden. If you go Dutch to Sweden, whilst if you go Dutch to Senegalese, it means you have far too much time on your hands. The reason it means lower countries is because of its low land and flat geography, with only about 50% of its land exceeding one metre above sea level. It has been posited that if 25% of the population had a bath and pulled the plug out at the same time, it would flood the country. However, it is not possible for most people to have a bath because, due to its low lyingness, it's a word if I say it is, every time they turn the tap on, a fish comes out. Shower injuries are commonplace, as one minute you're washing your hair with shampoo, the next you're washing it with an octopus. Most people in Hull, Stroke, Nether, Lance, yes, it's a country if I say it is, now go to the bathroom in the bushes outside their house, or, if I type that wrong, in the buses outside their house. Until 19... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Until... <laughs> Until 1978, when a law was passed stipulating that all toilet basins must be 18 feet off the floor, bottom bites from sharks were commonplace, and A&E departments used to be filled with Dutchmen asking for shrimps to be removed from their willies. Nurse, did they come up the toilet when you were doing a wee? Hans, <clears throat> uh, uh, yeah, uh, let's go with that. With a population density of 412 people per kilometer squared, 907 if water is excluded, 493 if frog men are included back in, the Netherlands is classified as a very densely, densely populated country. Only Bangladesh, South Korea and Taiwan have both a larger population and higher population density. To combat this in 1812, a law was passed that if you had a third child, you had to carry them on your shoulders from the time of their 18th birthday. This caused great problems when the youth started dating, as fathers had to hold their son aloft while he had a knee trembler, and if the lad was using the rhythm method, one false step could result in either unplanned pregnancy or unplanned hair gel. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the law was rescinded after the great wedding catastrophe of, oh, let's say 1842, when three sets of triplets married at the same time, and the ensuing carnage of ruptured knees, spines, and imaginations shocked even this liberal thinking nation. Despite its population density, the Netherlands is the world's second largest exporter of food and agricultural products. This is... I'm getting a very Richard Attenborough voice here, aren't I? This is partly due to the fertility of the soil and the mild climate, and partly due to it all floating away into Belgium, after the clever Belgians, it's an abbreviation if I say it is, made all their heavier citizens go and live in their southernmost cities, thus causing that part of Belgium's landmass to be on a tilt with the border with Netherlands. All was going well until they realised this ploy also affected sewage. Louis the Belge, wiping a turd off his head. We did not think this through. What the... <laughs> prehistory. The prehistory of the Netherlands was largely shaped by the sea and the rivers that constantly shifted the low-lying geography. The oldest human, Neanderthal traces... Oh, read it properly, man. The oldest human, 
brackets, Neanderthal, close brackets, traces, were found in higher soils near Maastricht from what is estimated to be about 250,000 years ago and are believed to be of people who could hold their breath for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. Due to the similarity of the words, in 1934, Professor Patrick O'Deary Mee, remember him from modern Golia, claimed to have found 18 million living Neanderthals in Holland. No, they are Netherlanders, wrote the National Geographic Association to him. Ofaku me, wrote back the notoriously dyslexic prof. At the end of the Ice Age, the nomadic <laughs> late Upper Paleolithic Hamburg culture, circa 13,000 to 10,000 BC, hunted reindeer in the area using fishing rods. <laughs> <laughs> While the later Arnsberg culture, circa 11,200 to 9,500 BC, used bow and arrow. The swiftly extinct Dumbassa culture, circa 9,500 to 9,499 11 months BC, used the idea of covering themselves in reindeer food as a means of attacking the creatures. Reindeer number one. Here, yeah, but there's something strange about these plants. Reindeer number two a.k.a. Bert. In what way? Reindeer number one. They've got bones in them, and they go, ouch, when you bite them. I know it's that. Tasty, though. Yes, finally. Being a vegetarian and finding something decent to eat. How come you haven't been given a name? If there's a movie in the book, I'll be easier to cast. Tulips. Almost 80% of the world's flower bulbs come from the Netherlands, and the highest cause of mortality in the country is from people sneezing themselves to death. <laughs> the majority of the bulbs are tulips, of which as many as 3 million bulbs are produced annually. I'm glad I pronounced that word right. <laughs> Hello, Mandy Dexter. <laughs> Sorry. The stay on, focus man. Not all of these are exported as bulbs. Many are first made into cakes, picnic campers, oil pipelines, and mobile telephones. For a while, sales of the tulip phone were chasing those of the Apple phone, with figures reaching as high as one on the first day of release and before tailing off. The popularity and cultivation of the tulip in the United Provinces, now the Netherlands, as if two names weren't enough already, is generally thought to have started in earnest around 1593, when a man named Ernest ate some strange seeds and crapped out a Semper Augustus. As it wouldn't flush. <laughs> We'll get there in a minute, folks. <laughs> Playing the guitar is a lot easier. As it wouldn't fly. No, <laughs> oh, mama. And see, but not hurt. As it wouldn't fly, she put it in his window box, meaning to take it to the river when it had cooled down. A passing neighbour. Hence laying, <laughs> saw it and made inquiries. Hence, I won't bother to do the names, I guess you'll work out that who's speaking and who isn't. What is that in your window box, Ernest? It's a tur, uh, a tur, a tur, a tu, 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 tulip. A tulip, you say? Yes, I did. Go back and read the last line if you don't believe me. Where did you get it from? From my arse, or, 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 from my aunt. It is very lovely. Does it have a smell? Oh, I'll say that's why it's on the window. Could you get me one? I would pay handsomely for such a bloom. Handsomely, you say? Yes, I did. Go back and read the last line if you don't believe me. I do believe that, and that I can provide you with one as well. Shall we say fifty guilders? Okay. Ernst and Hans together. Fifty guilders. Hans. When is it likely to be here? Ernest, come back this afternoon, just after my coffee break. That is a quick delivery. Four cups of strong black will do that to you. <laughs> Soon, Ernest was being called upon by all the citizens of Arnhem and was producing several baskets a day and had a coal on the size of a windsock to ship for it. 
He took on laborers to help keep up with demand, telling them the pay is great but the job is shit. He established a production line. <laughs> In a small building on a remote industrial estate, which helped shield the public from the screams of the team on the large bulb head varieties. And he introduced the four hours on, four hours off shift pattern, i.e. four hours on the toilet, four hours off to the nurse for some KY jelly and an ice pack. <laughs> After the Flemish botanist Carolus Clusius had taken up a post, I can't even read the words anymore, my eyes are so watery. After the Flemish botanist Carolus Clusius had taken up a post at the University of Leiden and had established the Hortus Academicus, the oldest botanical garden of the Netherlands, although at that point it was the youngest. <laughs> he planted his collection of tulip bulbs and found they were able to tolerate the harsher conditions of the low countries. And why not? If you can tolerate a six hour journey out of the intestine of an 18 stone Dutch docker, you can pretty much put up with anything. Shh! Presently thereafter, the tulip began to bloom in popularity. <laughs> the tulip was different from every other flower known to Europe at that time, with a saturated, intense petal colour that no other plant had, and the power of flight. <laughs> <laughs> However, domestication and inbreeding soon diminished the latter skill, and from 1600 onwards the tulip became a landlocked flower. In horticulture, tulips are divided up into 15 groups, brackets, divisions, mostly based on flower morphology and plant size. And in the late 1590s, <laughs> rectal damage potential. Uh, <clears throat> Division one, single early with cup shaped single flowers, no larger than eight centimeters across i.e. three inches. They bloom early to mid-season, growing 15 to 45 centimeters tall. Division two, double early, with fully double flowers, bowl shapes to eight centimeters across. Plants <laughs> typically grow from 30 to 40 centimeters tall. Known for getting up in the middle of the night so as not to be late. NB not to be confused with double penetration. Oh, sorry, not to be confused with double penetration unless you're using them specifically for that. <laughs> Division three, triumph. Single cup-shaped flowers up to six centimeters wide. Plants grow 35 to 60 centimeters tall and bloom mid to late season. Good singers. Division four, Darwin hybrid. Single flowers, ovoid in shape and up to eight centimeters wide. Plants grow 50 to, centime 50 to 70 centimetres tall and bloom mid to late season. Discovered on the Galapagos Islands, they survive by eating all the weaker tulips and evolving into a flower that could go to the supermarket and buy their own dinner. <laughs> Div 5. Single late. Cup or goblet shaded flowers up to 8 centimetres wide. Some plants produce multi-flowering stems. Plants grow 45 to 75 centimetres tall and bloom late season, as they can then get a chalet with ensuite bathroom for a bargain price. Div 6 Lily Flower. The flowers possess a distinct narrow waist with a pointed and a reflex petal. Previously included with the old Darwins, only becoming a group in their own right in 1958, after a lengthy legal battle that resulted in the bankruptcy of the old Darwins, who also lost all the royalties from their first five albums. Division 6, Fringe, a.k.a. Crisper, come in ready salted, cheese and onion, and barbecue flavour. Div 6, Viridiflora, these grow between 8 centimetres and 45 metres high. The latter bloom in panto season and are generally paired with a giant and a boy named Jack. Div 9, Rembrandt, 
generally considered one of the greatest visual tulips in the history of art. Notable works include The Storm on the Sea of Galilee, oil on canvas, Shooting Company of France Banning Cock and Wilhelm van Rooshtix, oil on canvas, and Self-Portrait in Window Box, fertilizer on soil. Bloomed 15 July 1606 to 14 October 1669. Uh, those in the know know that is Rembrandt's date of birth and date of death. You've got to look for the little ones as well, you see. Don't be naughty. Div 10, parrot. <laughs> well, I've got no idea what that says. But anyway, known for their beautiful plumage and desire for a cracker. Division 11, double late, large heavy blooms. They range from 18 to 22 inches tall and are the natural entries of Div 2, double early. Division 12, Kalfkomania, the water lily tulip. Medium large creamy yellow flowers marked red on the outside and yellow at the centre. My voice is going up and down like a, well, I was say something rude, but fond of ice skating. <laughs> Stem six inch tall, but the roots are 493 meters in depth, so they are never pulled up, as to do so would tip the world off its axis by six degrees. Div 6, Fosteriana, the Emperor Tulip. Work extensively in cabaret with occasional forays into serious drama. The tulip only production of Eugene Ionesco's Rhinoceros of the Cleethorpes Empire in 1957 is classed as one of the greatest theatrical experiences of all time, more so since Ionescu didn't write the play until 1959. NB, Emperor, Cleethorpes Empire. Some of these are really subtle, aren't they? Div 14, Griegel. Scarlet flowers six inches across uh, on ten inch stems. Foliage mottled with brown. Look good in lingerie. Div 15, species, brackets, botanical, close brackets. So called because they still make appearances in the rectum of some people. Abbreviation, bottom, anus, maniacal. That was pretty clever. It looks a whole lot better on paper than it does when you say it out loud, I can tell you that. Div 16, multi-flowering. Not an official division. These tulips belong in the first 15 divisions, but often listed separately because they have multiple blooms per bulb. I myself have given my missus multiple blooms from my bulb. Fanar, fanar. How are we doing for time here? Oh, we're just about finished there. Okay, so the next bit was the history of the windmill. <laughs> But we're not going to do it. Thank you so much for your time and for indulging me that I enjoyed that probably more than you did. It's been a long time since I read that. I wish I'd read it better for you, but uh, uh, long time viewers know that I do have that. Oh, look at this. Dylan, Emily, if you're watching this, well, don't because you're 10, 11 years old and you shouldn't be listening to Daddy's rude words. Uh, but um, here we are. This is the last time we had snow, which would be February the 2017. Anyway, thank you so much for your time, folks. Peace, love to everyone. Oh, it's a long way away.